sounds okay to you, Stanislav. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So guys, um, today we are gonna be hearing a wonderful, I'm sure will be wonderful, <laughs> presentation from one of our uh, visiting class. scholars over at Hamilton Luger, um, uh, Stanislav uh, Budinsky. And this is gonna be focusing on Russia's digital multipolarity toward a cultural theory of internet governance. Um, I have to say, I found this absolutely fascinating. Um, I've been very much on the outside kind of looking in for some of these topics for a while now, especially from Russia's perspective here on this. So really, really excited um, to uh, to hear your talk, Stanislav. Thanks for joining us virtually. I wish we could do it in person. Uh, hopefully soon enough we can. Yeah. Uh, but over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the introduction, this opportunity, and thanks everyone for um, coming. So uh, just by way of brief background, uh, if you had a chance to read the, the circulated paper, you probably noticed that it refers to it as a chapter. So I just want to explain uh, what this is a chapter of, uh, where it fits in. Um, so this is part of the book project that I'm working on, which the aim of which is to kind of introduce the cultural approach, framework, theory, uh, reading, whatever you want to call it, of the dynamics of uh, global internet governance or global politics of uh, surrounding internet governance. And the case study, my primary case study is Russia's approach. Uh, my secondary uh, case is Estonia and I'll be happy to um, address a kind of that comparative dynamic in, in the Q&A um, if anyone is interested. And so this is kind of a very first draft um, outlining generally this, uh, this framework using the example uh, of Russia. And again, I refer in this chapter to like the previous chapter this, did this and the next chapters did that. So, you know, uh, some of the things that are kind of missing are presumably going to be in the, you know, before and after. So again, I'm happy to address any, if, you know, if there's anything that, uh, that you thought was missing um, that is in the book would be preceding or, or coming after, I'm happy to kind of elaborate and fill those gaps um, if there's a need for that. So um, with that, I will um, start. And just because we all studied different um, aspects and areas of governance, I just want to briefly introduce the particular area that I'm focusing on, global internet governance, sort of what it is, why it's important, um, and what it stands for. And um, you know, as cliche as it sounds, um, you know, the internet is now everywhere, as this uh, chart helpfully shows us of global chart of global internet governance issues. And you know, in the broadest sense, you can think of internet governance being pretty much everywhere because all sorts of actors across all sorts of domain are conducting some form of governance of the internet. So you can think of your local internet service provider doing some of internet governance. You know, uh, major platforms, Google, Facebook, they're conducting governance in terms of, let's say, uh, privacy uh, or data. Um, user data, uh, speech, et cetera. Obviously, you know, national governance, uh, governments, national legislatures are passing laws that um, obviously uh, also impact on that. So in that broadest sense, internet governance these days, again, I know it's a cliche, but pretty much everywhere. However, the, uh, what I understand by internet governance in line with this um, you know, subfield or, or field or subdiscipline that emerged over the past 10, 15 years, um, is a, a internet governance in a narrower sense, a governance specifically of the critical resources and infrastructures of the global internet. So the infrastructure, the technology, the protocols, the standards that essentially make you know, the internet work. Make sure that you know, when we fire out our laptops every day and we enter some uh, name of some website, that's exactly what we get and that sort of everything works. So this is the more narrow sense of um, internet governance that I am uh, focused on. And I will provide uh, just one quick example sort of of the, of the stakes that are involved and why it's become uh, such a, a hot topic as of late, which is what, uh, and you know, an example that's familiar to all of us from our daily lives, which is again, uh, you know, if, when you go to your browser, you type in, let's say iu.edu and you expect to, you know, 10 times out of 10 to receive to arrive at the you know, official homepage of Indiana University. And the um, organization that um, uh, governs this function um, is a, you know, a private company uh, based outside of uh, California and that is not sort of answerable currently to other national governments. So uh, it is also the organization that is responsible for the sort of governance of the kind of domain name extension. So, you know, .gov, uh, 
uh, uh, .com.edu. And as of late, kind of an area of new um, extensions such as you know, .gay, .islam, .wine. And as you see from this um, headlines, from this news headlines, a lot of the governments, which again, just to reiterate, don't really have a say uh, about it, were very upset for their you know, different reasons. So Saudi Arabia was upset that this kind of nonprofit, non-governmental organization introduced dot gay and dot Islam uh, because of you know, uh, Saudi Arabia's sort of religious and you know, cultural sensitivities um, uh, pertaining to those particular um, kind of cultural domains. France was upset about that organization introducing that wine, uh, both for cultural reasons, because as they explain, sort of, you know, wine is associated with France and, you know, kind of wine comes from France, and for economic reasons, because it's a huge part of their economy. But again, they had no say about it. Um, and it did not automatically, the dot wine domain did not auto automatically go to France. Um, and so, again, just to uh, reiterate these organizations, the, this particular one that is in charge of both, you know, us arriving at the exact page that we want to arrive and of this uh, domain name uh, extensions is Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It's quite a mouthful and I'm sure pretty much no one other outside of the realm of uh, scholars of Internet have heard of it, and yet it has this huge, huge um, impact, you know, governance powers and just some other ones here that are in charge of governing kind of standards and, and protocols for, again, making sure that our internet, you know, runs smoothly and it does exactly what we expect it to do. So we go about our days without kind of thinking about these things, but these are in fact some of the most powerful organizations um, in the world. And the crux of the issue, the crux, um, kind of the, the problem at the center of this geopolitical debates and why they've gotten so you know, heated over the past uh, two decades is that, again, I, I keep repeating myself, but they're not really answerable to um, national governments of the world. And as you saw from these examples above, uh, increasingly those governments are upset about it because there's, it's a financial issue, it's or economic issue, it's, it's a cultural issue, it's a political issue, it's a, it's a security issue. Uh, it's a human rights issue, you know, it's, I could go on and on and on. It's a lot of things are implicated um, or embedded in this governance of what seemingly is, is, is a technical thing, but it, no more sort of, it, 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 you know, these days we can't really think of the internet as just purely kind of a, uh, a technical domain or internet infrastructure as purely a technical domain as, as we've just discussed. And so what we saw um, over the past, um, couple of decades, but especially this, this past decade since around 2010 or, or the late uh, 2000s, is the emergence and sort of crystallization of these uh, national, different national stances and, and various camps, geopolitical camps that have emerged that promote different visions and different views and different associated narratives and stories about, you know, what the internet is, what it should be, who and how should govern it. Um, and so um, sometimes it's broken into, you know, like two binary camps of democracies and authoritarians, but I like to think of it more of as a, as a spectrum, which certainly has its kind of nodes and camps, but, but it's kind of like more of a um, spectrum nonetheless. So I, I try not to think of it as kind of this uh, binary, binary categories. And so um, on one end of the spectrum, um, on the left, you can see at the time, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, presenting uh, the United States uh, Internet Freedom uh, Program, the program of the uh, U.S. State Department. And the gist of that program um, is that basically let's keep things as they are because the, you know, kind of the, the mantra is that if it's not uh, broken, you know, uh, there's nothing to fix. Kind of internet has been working smoothly. It has been performing its function. Uh, you know, yes, national governments are not for historic reasons because of how internet has developed, uh, don't have a say in it as much as they do traditionally with other forms of telecommunication, but it works. It has, you know, it's this amazing thing that humanity has come up with. Let's keep it that way. Now, of course, that is partially true um, or, you know, that is true, but it also happened, of course, to benefit the US government's um, kind of uh, economic security interests because it could also be read as the United States essentially saying, let's keep the internet under 
um, you know, dominance of uh, US-based non-governmental organizations, the one that we just saw kind of a couple of slides ago um, under uh, US kind of uh, corporation influence. So this narrative is both has sort of a humanitarian for sure element of it uh, and kind of a self-interested um, element as well. Um, on the other end of the spectrum are countries like China and Russia foremost, and a number of countries that are supportive of this agenda, which are saying, no, no, no. The real story is that the internet began as this kind of free uh, domain, uh, a domain kind of a humanitarian purpose. And then it was co-opted, you know, first by the US government and more recently by the US corporations. And so in order to return this domain to its original kind of humanitarian purpose where it serves the whole of humanity as opposed to just kind of narrow US governmental and corporate interests, let's put it under the governance of, uh, let's say the United Nations or the International Telecommunication Union uh, or some other intergovernmental organizations. Because you know we, the governments are uh, representatives of our people. We're invested with legitimacy because we're elected. And so, you know, it is us, the governments who should govern the internet and uh, the private sector or civil society sort of should um, be at the table, but it kind of secondary roles because they were not elected by, by anyone. And again, here there is, a, you know, I believe an, an element of legitimate critique, uh, but of course, coming from the states that are kind of renowned, you know, abusers of human rights, let's say, or freedom of expression, there's also a, a worry, a legitimate worry by many that this is um, sort of a, a pretense to place greater controls over, um, over the internet. And, and recently, and especially after the Snowden revelations, there is another camp that uh, tries to advance, that has led, uh, I think in my estimation, France has been the most vocal proponent of this uh, agenda is sort of say, saying, well, let's not lock, lock ourselves into this kind of restrictive binary visions of either keeping everything under US, you know, essentially US control in some ways or giving the internet to the likes of China and Russia. Let's kind of create this third way, third path where we have kind of both a greater role for the government than currently uh, is because again, as we saw in another sli slide, France is also not entirely happy with the current system but let's have this kind of genuine collegial democratic forum where, where you know, the civil society is at the table, the corporations at the table, but governments are also at the table more so than they currently are. Um, and not everything is decided by this kind of, uh, you know, California based organization that is not answerable to, you know, the 16 million of French citizens or to 80 million of German citizens, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why in, in essence, this is why it has become such a hot topic and this is how it rose or ascended over the past two decades to, you know, from a domain, kind of a niche diplomatic domain to now, uh, these are all photos, by the way, kind of when those people were specifically addressing internet governance. So the most powerful people of the world are now really concerned with, you know, uh, the nuts and bolts of, um, of, of the internet and who, who and how should govern it. And so in line with the ascendancy of uh, the geopolitics of internet governance, you naturally also see an ascendancy in a scholarly or academic interest uh, toward this domain. Um, and this graph uh, very helpfully, because I used to just kind of narrate this, but this graph very helpfully came out uh, last fall in, in this um, a great collection of researching internet governance from MIT. Um, and it depicts the increase in the number of articles that talk explicitly about internet governance. And what it shows, um, hopefully you can see, is that the field has been dominated by uh, the uh, disciplinary approaches of uh, law, political science, and that uh, you know this darkest spot, the sociology, uh, occupies kind of a tiny, tiny minority in the, uh, in the overall studies of, um, of internet governance. And by sociology, essentially what is meant here are all the sort of discursive, qualitative, interpretive, or you know, in the broad sense, you could say cultural approaches. Now within that already kind of tiny minority, and even tinier minority, literally a handful of, of, of works, are concerned specifically with the role of nationalism or national identity constructions uh, and the role that they play in informing or you know, underlying or guiding, again, whichever ver verb you fancy, um, 
how countries approach the internet, you know, why France advances this position, why China advances this position. And so it is this kind of uh, tiny minority that I'm uh, trying to expand and, and, and fill in this kind of uh, what I view or diagnose as kind of this gap or somewhere where uh, there's a lack of scholarship or a lack of understanding how those dynamics of nationalism and national identity play into the dynamics of national approaches and then by extension of the global dynamics of internet governance. So this is where my uh, research fits in and why kind of um, it is warranted at this, at this time. And so again, specifically, I ask, uh, you know, how do national identity constructions inform national uh, approaches to the internet? And as I mentioned at the outset, my primary case is Russia. And then I have one chapter um, on Estonia as a comparative case. Um, and so Russia's great power identity um, informs its kind of statist or state centric uh, approach. And then Estonia's identity of um, kind of a European liberal Nordic uh, power that is returning to Europe after kind of Soviet occupation uh, uh, informs its support for the status quo. Kind of Estonia is, is in some ways second only to the United States in supporting the, the you know the current status quo and ma maintaining things as they are. And again, I'm happy to go into Estonia's case um, in the Q and A. And and the purpose of including Estonia was that uh, you know, it's almost too easy to say, well, of course, Russia is you know, nationalist or China is nationalist as opposed to uh, you know, liberal democracies, as opposed to the United States, as opposed to Estonia. And my, the whole point of my argument is that everyone is nationalist, right? You can be espousing, you know, and, and again, na by nationalist, I don't mean like, you know, ethno-nationalist or you know, xenophobic kind of in, in that sense, uh, but I mean rather, uh, built around this kind of national myths that underlie states, you know, the, the myth of the U.S. as the, um, this, you know, city upon the hill or the great experiment in democracy, you know, the, the founding myths, the founding national or nationalist myths that underlie uh, U.S. Uh, kind of national project and, and state project. So it is in this sense. And so the point is to show that, you know, everyone does it. It's not just kind of the authoritarians that, that, that do it. And it's not exclusive to them. Um, so just briefly in terms of data and methods. So this is based on my dissertation. So this is a research that, I've, that has been ongo ongoing for a number of years. And my primary method is textual analysis. So I look at pol policy, political and policy discourses, both documents, interviews, articles, speeches uh, by representatives of the states, uh, both as pertaining to the national identity constructions and as pertaining to um, uh, specifically internet governance. And so I conduct, if you will, kind of this analytical juxtaposition and trying to show uh, how kind of the uh, imaginaries and, and, and the uh, language of uh, what, how nations construct their national identity and themselves underlies and informs how they then think about the internet, approach the internet, what their normative position is about the internet um, and you know, who and how should govern it. And then additional methods uh, are kind of ethnographic, are um, expert interviews with media and uh, internet professionals in these countries and participant observations at a number of events. And these are just some illustrations for, from my, that I took um, during my field work in, in Moscow. I also did some field work in Estonia. Um, and so this is, for example, uh, you know, a major kind of internet governance, internet uh, security conference uh, where some of the ministers spoke and some of the kind of top officials spoke and advanced Russia's position. Um, at the top left corner, you see RT, Russia's uh, national broadcasters. I also interviewed uh, deputy editor, uh, deputy editor in chief of RT because what I'm trying to show also is how this narrative about the internet governance specifically, how they fit within countries broader uh, strategic narratives and strategic communication. So I wanted to understand kind of the, the linkages between sort of the narrative that RT um, is pushing out and how, uh, how it interconnects uh, with the narrative that uh, Russia pushes out about the internet specifically and the internet governance. And there is, you know, uh, they, their logic, I'm, ha I'm happy to report that indeed their logics kind of in language do very much uh, overlap and kind of um, infuse each other. And lastly, here's an illustration from Kaspersky, kind of Russia's leading cybersecurity firm um, in, in trying to understand um, kind of the relationship between state and non-state um, actors in, um, in Russia's advancement of its, of its position. 
And so now finally the last uh, kind of third section of, of this uh, presentation, uh, kind of my findings or this, this framework that I tried to outline or that I outlined in this chapter. Um, again, the basis of my argument is that uh, we can trace um, these um, positions of countries uh, about internet governance and the global internet to their national identity constructions. And of course, I don't mean identity in kind of essentialist sense, you know, as something static, something pre-given, something, you know, primordial, if you will. I am talking about identity constructions as they are constructed in discourse by, by, by state actors. Um, so it is a constant interplay uh, as I see it in that, you know, national elite, elites and, you know, citizenry and we as people, we are born into societies with kind of pre-given interpretive schemas and pre-given um, kind of lenses and discourses and narratives, which we are uh, enculturated in, you know, through mass media, through education. But at the same time, there is certainly human agencies. There are questions of politics and power in how then we as actors, uh, you know, shape and mold this very narrative. So it's a constant reiterative uh, process. So uh, culture is neither kind of completely static, uh, nor completely uh, created anew, you know, every time or every generation um, in, in, in how I approach it, I approach it analytically, but rather this kind of constant dialectic. And so Russia's great power identity um, is something that has been has kind of underlain Russia's state nationalism and foreign policy for you could say uh, the past 300 years with from the times of Peter the Great who first tried to um, kind of attain this uh, recognition of Russia as a, as a great power by by Western uh, by uh, Western powers and so there is kind of this tremendous uh, continuity both historical and consensus at every uh, given moment. So uh, sort of across the ideological spectrum. And this is what makes uh, kind of this great uh, power identity uh, an interesting case um, in that from the liberal end of the political spectrum to the kind of traditional sort of conservative or isol isolationist end of the spectrum, everyone will tell you that Russia is a great power. So this is something that's sort of a matter of, of kind of non-negotiable sort of consensus, if you will. Um, and there is a whole, there's a menu, if you will, of, of uh, justifications for why Russia is a great power. You know, it's history, it's military power, it's culture, um, it's territory size, you know, multi-ethnic uh, composition of its population. So a whole host of menus from which actors strategically draw in support of their specific agenda. So for example, a liberal might emphasize culture and say, well, you know, Russia is part of, you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are part of this great uh, world or European culture, and therefore Russian is a great European, you know, power. Uh, and isolationists might say, well, we have this nuclear arsenal, you know, and if you mess with us, uh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna regret it, you're gonna pay. So pursuing a completely different end while still using this uh, notion of, uh, of great power. But what essentially everyone agrees upon and what is, the, what is at the core of this argument about Russia as a great power is this idea of strategic independence, which is that Russia is free to pursue its, um, uh, to kind of have its domestic sovereignty. So pursuit of uh, domestic uh, affairs independent of inter external uh, interference in its own affairs. And it's free to pursue its interests abroad. And in particularly what is most important to us, I guess, is it, it, it sees itself as a, uh, having a full sort of right to full participation in global governance. So it sees itself as kind of inherently being at the table with other great powers in deciding the fates um, of the world, including of you know, telecommunication and internet governance. And so after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union in 1991, this idea is to kind of form of this framework of multipolarity. And this framework um, has several kind of key uh, proposition upon which it rests. It is that, first of all, uh, the, um, and I should say that, you know, the, 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 the reason it, it came into existence is because, you know, in 1981, when Russia kind of overnight uh, ceased to be kind of a world super, superpower, um, it needed to come up with a kind of a self, a legitimacy narrative, a, a, a self-legitimizing sort of strategic narrative, why it should, you know, maintain its position as one of the 
uh, governance of the world, even though materially it was so much uh, weaker. And the argument is that the world is this, you know, diverse place, uh, you know, culturally, socially, politically, and that uh, the principle of state sovereignty uh, um, ensures that, you know, uh, this kind of global diversity that uh, Russia is free to pursue its whatever it sees as fit because it's sovereign Brazil uh, has its own cultural and political system and is free to do it because it's sovereign and no one has the right to tell it what it is. And so the problem is that, you know, there is this global hegemon or a global monopolist or kind of a global dominant uh, power that is at the time was kind of only uh, emerging. And that we need to kind of uh, oppose this uh, emergent unipolarity uh, by relying in our global governance on institution on multilateral institutions, first and foremost, the United Nations um, and international law. Uh, so kind of these uh, institutions in Russia's narrative and Russia's imagination were meant to sort of curtail this emergent US uh, dominance and kind of maintain Russia's position as one of the um, leading powers because of course, Russia is one of the uh, members of the UN Security Council. So if everything is decided, if, if all key uh, decisions are run through the UN Security Council, where Russia is one of the five permanent members and it has the veto right, then of course Russia by default maintains its position as one of the, um, you know, co-governments, governors of the world. Uh, but the legitimate, uh, again, in order to kind of um, legitimize this uh, stance and not have it sort of viewed as exclusively serving Russia's narrow interests, um, it is couched in the rhetoric of democratization of world order, as opposed to, again, the monopolization by the US, that uh, governance of the world by multilateral organizations, by international law, will make the world and the uh, metaphors that are always used is um, uh, kind of a, a more equal, fair, um, and uh, just place. So kind of there is this number of metaphors that when you see them, they sort of signify this um, this, this, uh, this framework of multipolarity. Um, and this on the right, the, the statue is to Yevgeny Primakov, the foreign minister and prime minister of Russia in the second half of the 90s, um, whose name is associated with kind of instilling this, with coming up with this multipolarity doctrine and instilling it as the center of Russia's foreign policy. And you can see this, uh, the monument to him was opened in 2019 and Putin is uh, laying flowers to it at its unveiling because he has been made into this kind of this founding father of Russia's post-Soviet independence that, you know, after this first initial years of kind of subservience to the West, you know, 92, 93, 94, when Russia kind of looked to the West and was eager to join the West, you know, he was the one who came and said like, no, Russia is an independent power. You know, we must not uh, kind of, uh, toe the Western line, we should pursue our own independent policy. So it's kind of valorized as this uh, person who returned Russia to its um, kind of independence in foreign policy. And what's interesting and what I show with my research is that even though, yes, he is central to, uh, you know, making into this coherent doctrine and, and instilling it into as Russia's foreign policy, but in fact, uh, Russia was pursuing this multipolarity kind of discourse and multi, you know, polarity vision in those very years, in those most liberal, um, you know, early years uh, of its post-Soviet existence, when it very much was, you know, wanted genuinely to become part of the kind of Euro-Atlantic world. And this, again, uh, the way, you know, we can explain it is because, again, uh, no matter if it's its most liberal period of, you know, 92, 93, or its utmost illiberal period, which is currently, in all of these periods, Russia views itself as a great power that is going to oppose uh, kind of U.S., uh, what is, you know, uh, constructs as U.S. hegemony in the world. Um, and so, you know, these are just some quotes from 92 versus 20 years later. On the left here, this is Russia's first address at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, so Russia is kind of introducing a new Russia to the world, you know, who we are, you know, first time as an independent Russia, as a not Soviet Union. And you can see already Russia is talking about, so right, so it decries this post-communist, you know, communism says it's, that it's rejected communism, that's no longer has anything to do with communism. You know, we're new, we're democratic, we're liberal. And yet you can see kind of using the same uh, foundational 
propositions of, you know, there is this monopolistic system that is emerging and we need to instead build a world that is based on this multipolar unity in diversity based around the United Nations. Um, 20 years later, you can see Putin in very different terms toward, uh, toward very different ends rather, kind of this very, um, almost like with the religious kind of culturalist civilizational talk of God-given diversity of the world, but essentially, you know, you know, talking about the same things, talking about how uh, there's this attempts to um, reinvent or, or revive this uh, unipolar world. So again, the same thing that uh, Russia was talking in its most liberal period in 92, that we should rely on international law and national sovereignty instead in order to protect this God-given diversity of the world. So this key propositions, even though they, as Russia was becoming increasingly liberal, they were couched in more and more sort of conservative, traditionalist, civilizational, sometimes even you know, religious uh, kind of lingo, but the key and core propositions have remained the same over the, amazingly have remained the same over this 30 years, even as Russia kind of underwent this trajectory from its most liberal place, perhaps ever in its, you know, thousand year history in you know 92 and 93 when it wanted to kind of be embraced embrace the west and be embraced by the west uh throughout its sort of disillusion and gradual uh, going towards its kind of most illiberal place that it is currently at and so to bring it back finally to uh internet governance and digital multipolarity and i will conclude with this slide you can see when you look, when, when you conduct this, as I call it, kind of analytical juxtaposition between the discourses, the corpus of discourses of how Russia talks about itself and its place in the world and how Russia talks about the internet, you can see this, how it completely sort of this, its internet governance imaginary and lexicon are completely kind of infused and structured, in, if you will, by its um, ideas, um, about its national identity, its place in the world, the world order. And so you can see uh, the general propositions and the specific uh, language uh, that are being uh, put to the same kind of use of uh, opposing what Russia sees as uh, digital hegemony or digital uh, unipolarity of, uh, of the United States. And so in the same way that Russia talks about, you know, there should be no country alone that governs the world, there should be no sole universal superpower, it applies uh, the same um, uh, language and the same logic when it talks about um, uh, internet governance uh, and global digital order. So these are just two uh, examples from 2015 and 2018 of Russia's prime minister at the time and then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, press release talking about uh, what it sees, how the internet should, how the internet should be governed, what the digital uh, world order should be. So again, you can see the references to, um, you know, the decrying of the sole universal regulator, the fact that it should be based on international law uh, on the UN. And, you know, finally, the conclusion here is that, you know, it is only through this that we can build a fair and equal world order in the digital sphere. So again, the, the same kind of mapping on uh, of the um, you know, ideas and language about Russia's national identity as a great power, its role in the world, onto uh, Russia's discourse and understanding of, um, of global internet governance. Uh, so yeah, I think I'm uh, definitely out of time. So thank you very much. And just to conclude very briefly on a bit of self-promotion, which is that I will, I'm teaching a course in global internet governance this in a, that starts in a few weeks and there are still spots left. So if you know of any undergraduate or master level students who may be interested, then please uh, uh, mention this course and I'll be happy to have them enroll. Uh, so thank you very much. How about a round of applause for Stanislav? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that was super interesting and happy to help with the latter point as well. Um, I can send out a note. Maybe if you wouldn't mind, um, Stanislav, after we're, after we're done, we'll just, we'll just um, uh, do a quick email exchange so I get some more information about the course mm -hmm. and I'm happy to push it out. But no, this is just a fascinating presentation. So as always, guys, feel free to use the chat box, use the raise hand feature to help us keep the queue. Um, and maybe while that's starting, you know, it, so, there's so many points to pick up on there. Um, so I, I hardly even know where to begin, frankly. Um, it, it struck me, and I'm wondering if you found this in your research, that I, I seem to recall even beyond just the multipolarity point, 
that some Russian policymakers have also even evoked the concept of polycentricity and mm -hmm. how they would like to see the world order um, emerge in the 21st century, which is, you know, from the workshops tradition and kind of point of view, an interesting take on polycentricity, right? They kind of view it in terms of what you were describing, the opposite of kind of a, of a hegemonic, um, you know, unipolar system with kind of the U.S. sitting on top and in terms of a more, more, you know, fragmented, you know, shall we say, approach to, um, to international relations. And I'm wondering, does it, do, do you take on the on that mantle of, you know, polycentricity versus this unipolar system? Or do you think that really it's more the multipolarity and much more nation state specific? That's my sense, mm -hmm. since I don't think that they view, you know, the activities of civil society or the private sector or, or academia as, as adding a lot of useful dialogue <laughs> to this conversation. <laughs> So I just love to have your take on that. Then we'll yeah. turn to you next, Brian. Yeah. So, so at some point uh, a few years ago, kind of the the metaphor of polycentricity started kind of surfacing. And um, essentially, the short answer is that it's basically a synonym of multipolarity. It's just been used uh, as a complete synonym. So it's not any kind of ideational rethinking, or it doesn't signal any. Um, uh, difference or or changing of kind of a normative position or or, or the governance mechanisms that Russia views. Uh, one, um, uh, it wasn't a formal interview; it was just kind of an informal conversation at, at one of during my field work with one of the kind of like people in the know. And he basically said that it was a conscious decision a few years ago to start using this uh, metaphor of polycentricity by the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs because. Um, in trying to kind of because the language of polaria, right, it comes out of the Cold War kind of uh, vocabulary, right, invented uh, or uh, first came up with kind of a realist IR scholars uh, in the kind of the thick of the Cold War. And so there is kind of this uh, association with this confrontational or confrontationalism, if you will, kind of underlying just the very language of polarity and poles and it invokes the you know clashing poles or the contestation and so so as as that person shared with me uh kind of informally that was the idea of the mfa in a in, in trying to kind of gradually change or, or, or use this policy interesting so that's pretty much was the idea behind it it doesn't signify any major change in worldview or outlook or, or anything of the sort that's fascinating have you already been in touch with mike uh, mcginnis about about some of your work on this, because after not, his no. presentation on polycentricity in the colloque series, I, I I know that he would be interested, frankly, in speaking with you, Stanislav. So I'll, I'll connect you guys as well. Uh, Brian, please. Good. Okay. In a sense, going to continue on to the same topic um, in terms of the question, but first, uh, kind of a comment. Um, you know, the paper was interesting to read and good, but. Um, what might be added even more, and from this perspective of somebody who for a while in the early 90s was looking at some of this and what had gone on in the 80s, what does, could be emphasized even more clearly is the extent to which there was a very deliberate attempt to avoid or bypass the ITU. The sense mm -hmm. that you know putting it under the ITU would just kill the development of these potentially amazing new technologies. And the and in sense of you know crafting institutions, you know it was a very deliberate and at times quite self-conscious approach to creating an alternative set of institutions, which you can argue succeeded spectacularly at least for a long time. You can also say that doesn't mean they all work well now. There are some fundamental things that are broken or challenged, including cybersecurity and election influence and some things like that. So there's a need for change. And on the other hand, and part of what you're dealing with, there are clearly a bunch of nation states which are pretty determined to try and assert better control within their country. And they increasingly have the tools to be able to do that. And so that's you know just part of the context. Um, so that's where um, I'd be interested if you'd talk more about you know what you were just mentioning the multilateralism in a more genuine sense you know where you talk about the French and I would suggest not just a spectrum you know there may be two dimensions three dimensions on which things could vary in terms of how power is distributed which is, is you know key part of the polycentric 
stuff and to, in a sense, you know, is there any hope left for a polycentric multilateral approach, especially, you know, the paper, you're pretty clearly arguing a lot of what the Russians are pushing when they say multipolar, it's basically an oligarchy. It's just Russia gets to still be one of the oligarchs. Mm -hmm. um, but given their need to compromise with other actors, nations, and companies and users, are there things that would still create the potential for stuff that could still end up, you know, much more polycentric, much more people working out institutions together, you know, standards based for mutual benefit, those kind of things. So what are the prospects for a multilateral polycentric kind of approach? Mm -hmm. thank yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, on your first point, definitely the so the chapter that precedes this discussion, because this chapter was uh, uh, is meant to outline kind of Russia framework, uh, just focus on the Russia's framework, but the chapter before that uh, does exactly what you pointed to it, it just oh. like basically traces the, the emergence of the field, the debates, you know, how, you know, the debates between ITU and ICANN and how uh, you know, some actors wanted it, uh, the internet governance to be placed under ITU at the you know, 90s, early 2000s. So I do trace that kind of the history of the, the institutional history of, of, of the field for sure, kind of in the, in the preceding chapter as I, uh, you know, as I envision it in the, in the, final, in the final product. Um, Great. Um, as to the prospects of uh, multi, uh, genuine multilateralism, multilateralism. So yeah, first of all, just to uh, as you rightly pointed up, uh, pointed out, um, the Russia's proposition of multilateralism is, uh, you're right. When Russia says multilateralism, it technically means multilateralism in that it will be under the United Nations. But again, as, as, as you said, and as I talk about in the paper, uh, of course, UN has a, this kind of oligarchic body, if you will, of the security council, which uh, makes some, uh, countries more, uh, um, Kind of powerful or have uh, have more power than others. So, um, in Russia's rhetoric of multilateralism is kind of a disguise for saying um, that Russia will be uh, kind of co-governing the world with other great powers, essentially. So, as one scholar calls it, uh, uh, who I quote in the paper, it is uh, multipolar multilateralism. So it's not it's not genuine. And one of the uh, as another scholar so, who I quote suggested. Uh, you know, it is one of Russia's most ingenious kind of diplomatic tricks that it that it uh, was able to conflate uh, multipolarism, which is you know essential governance by by a few great powers, and multilateralism, which implies this kind of democratic or equitable uh, governing mechanism, and that it uses it interchangeably, where whereas they 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 are not. Now, as to the genuine perspectives of it, uh, I think you know, kind of like personally, my position. Uh, kind of normatively falls probably closest to kind of like a France, uh, you know, that would be great if we could come up with this, you know, what Macron is talking about, what he calls a new multilateralism, where it is kind of a genuine more representation by national governments, which um, um, I do believe kind of need greater representation. And, you know, I, I, the thing is, the, the on paper, Russia's critiques all sound, uh, you know, fine and legitimate to me, right, uh, on paper. But if you uh, kind of place it in the context of the ends toward which they're often being used and the kind of uh, interests that, that underlie them, then it becomes more pro problematic. So the critiques themselves, I find of the current system, I, I concur with, uh, but of course they're more, um, uh, kind of like I more, read more readily agree uh, or I'm more read read ready to consign when they come from, you know, from France, um, which, in essence, critiques the current system along the same lines as Russia does. You know, it also talks about the lack of representation for uh, for national governments, and but it's just more open and seemingly more genuine in trying to get on board um, uh, non-state actors uh, than Russia does. Because one of the things that came up in my interviews with the Russian non-state actors is that. Um, Yes, the Russian state kind of has been trying to engage and involve them uh, more and more in the past decade, but it's been uh, under its own kind of agenda rather than in some sort of like true dialogue. And what the, you know, non, what private actors kind of shared with me is that basically their position is to kind of, um, we just don't, we just want to do our thing and we kind of like don't want to do it, deal, you know, we don't want to be involved, but, you know, we are involved to an extent that 
the state wants to involve us because we're also not in a position to kind of say no and just kind of uh, not at, you know attend this this or that conference you know with the Russian MFA. Um, mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, as to the prospects, I'm a, I'm a bad at like predicting or or you know so so I'm not gonna venture into saying what it will be in five to ten years. I think you know, there can be so many shock events like the, the Snowden, you know, revelations, which kind of shook the field of internet governance and led to the end of contract between, you know, the U.S. government and ICANN. So there, there can be so many things that, that can happen that will, they will, that will shake the dynamic. But currently the trend for sure is toward greater and greater talk of digital sovereignty. And, and uh, whereas, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, this, this notion of sovereignty or digital sovereignty was almost like a... Um, had this like explicitly negative connotation and was used as like, oh, you know, of course, Russia and China are talking about digital sovereignty. Now, France and Germany and Brazil and so many countries are talking about European digital sovereignty or just, you know, French digital sovereignty, German digital sovereignty. So the meaning of the, you know, the, the trends and the patterns and the metaphors that we think are legitimate or illegitimate, they're, they're, they're changing as we, as we have seen. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, refrain from kind of uh, talking about the prospects, but I do think it will be a good thing to have a more kind of genuine uh, degree of multilateralism indeed. Good. I can just do a quick follow up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a question, you know, maybe not prospects, but potential pathways, again, whether there could at least be the kind of dynamic that's argued behind the rule of law that you know, the elites are contesting and what they can end up agreeing on in some, at least under some circumstances is impartial laws, which then may be first among an elite, but get extended and so on. So that you, know, you can end up with those compromises becoming what's feasible in some cases. Yeah, uh, well, I think the, you mentioned, you, you, you referred to as impartial laws. And I think the problem is that uh, no one sees them as impartial because the Russians see the, you know, whatever propositions are made by, let's say, the United States or, or the, uh, you know, come out of the, the, the Tallinn, uh, you know, cybersecurity center as kind of advancing, uh, you know, Western agenda and uh, potentially uh, being targeted at Russia. Uh, you know, whatever Russia is proposing is seen as kind of trying to um, legitimize Russia's uh, kind of illicit practices and cover them up with um, international law. So I think the problem is that the, the parties at the table don't, at least up to now, it's been really hard to agree for them, you know, on, on some sort of um, kind of impartial, you know, impartial law because everyone sees it as as their, their counterpart, the other, part, the other party acting in, in, you know, in bad faith and essentially uh, covering up their own agendas and interests with the kind of veil of, you know, the legitimacy of international law. Thank you. Cool. No, thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah. Thank I want to make sure everyone has a chance to um, pose questions as well. So I'll keep an eye out. And so feel free to signal if you do. Okay. Um, what, one question I had too, and um, you touch on this just a little bit um, in the paper is just kind of what your thoughts are for you know, some of the multi-stakeholder initiatives that have come to the fore in recent years, like the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace, right? And the Christchurch call, more focusing on extremist content and disinformation, where you have, you know, in the case of the Paris call now, 60 plus countries along with you know, hundreds of companies, universities. IU was the first one actually to sign up to the Paris call, I'm happy to say a couple of years ago. Um, the US so far has not signed up to it. The only five eyes country that hasn't, we'll see how the Biden administration might change tact on that. Um, but you know, I'd love for you to comment on how useful you think those exercises are in terms of kind of cyber norms building here, as well as to your earlier point on you know, polycentricity and, and consent to your question as well, Brian, about how important coordination, you know, is to really make, um, you know, polycentric systems function. And so far, at least my personal experience in this space is that there's just not a very high degree of coordination between, for example, the UN group of government experts who the open ended working group and these kind of multi stakeholder processes and all the separate, you know, more private sector dialogues that are happening, like the Siemens Charter of Trust um, or the um, 
uh, you know, some of those related work on the Digital Geneva Convention, et cetera. So I'm just kind of wondering how, how, how do you see kind of all of that fitting together in this, you know, cyber regime complex to use Joe Nye's mm -hmm. term? Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to be honest, I'm not as, as closely familiar with the, with the Paris call and the, and the Christchurch uh, kind of initiatives. Totally okay. uh, so I can't be familiar with all this stuff. <laughs> I I certainly speak, <laughs> yeah, I can't speak to, to, to their specifics. Uh, so again, you know, it's hard for me to, um, uh, I mean, currently, you know, I'm not too, um, how would I put it? The, the, the you know, in the current context or the current, um, uh, you know, geopolitical context that we're going through, it's hard to be optimistic generally about um, some sort of everyone, you know, mm -hmm. uh, agreeing to uh, one thing and, you know, under the, the, the you know, the, the UN process of uh, and the process of in international information uh, security governance process that was um, going on under the UN auspices for the, you know, 20 years, uh, of course, mm -hmm. uh, broke into two different competing uh, processes and groups in 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. So if anything, there is more and more, I feel like, um, kind of frag fragmentation uh, um, uh, along, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, lines. And so, um, you know, I guess the world or the international community, you know, should remain hopeful and work towards some sort of dialogue and, and some sort of common understanding. But um, again, the, the most recent trends, I think, point in a somewhat another direction. And, and one of the, yeah, one of the quotes I actually provided in one of the previous slides was from the press release, uh, oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, this, yeah, this, this quote from 2018 is actually a press release from, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in response to this um, kind of the, uh, the breaking up of the interna international information security kind of governance discussions uh, under the auspice of the UN into these two distinct processes, one kind of led by Russia, the other by the US, if you will. And so in this, uh, in this press release, you know, Russia says that, you know, the historic West is kind of pursuing its narrow mercenary interests in, in, in doing this and, you know, breaking this process into two and kind of, so it, it uses this very, you know, confrontational rhetoric. And so uh, I'm just using it as an illustration to suggest that, you know, when such, when one party at the table calls the other kind of pursuing its, you know, own narrow mercenary interests, as opposed to building, you know, a fair and equal world order in the digital sphere, as Russia claims is what it's doing. Uh, it's hard to really imagine. Um, I mean, it's possible, but you know, currently that's what it is. It's parties calling the, the other kind of mercenaries pursuing their own narrow interests. At least that was the case, you know, two years ago. Yeah, no, and that's a great, great aspect of this to highlight, Stanislav. And I'm, I'm just keep an eye out, guys. So please don't let us dominate. Okay, please raise. We have a few more minutes left for questions, um, but unless I see others, just just one other. One other point that kind of came to mind as well, um, Stanislav, is we do really seem to be at a bit of a pivot point, you know, right now, mm -hmm. um, especially given some of the Trump administration access, um, especially in the last year. And even Sarah, during the colloquial presentation on Monday, kind of referred to some of those regarding TikTok, for example. And um, and it seems and it seems to be that you know not only a, a, among lots of Western countries, but at least last year from the U.S., we'll see how that changes now. Um, we're making pretty strong allusions to, as you were saying, the, the benefits of this kind of cyber sovereignty vision of the internet, which is the polar opposite of our historic, you know, vantage point of, of pushing a, an open global, uh, you know, secure, you know, global network commons, to use um, Hillary Clinton's phrasing, right, in her remarks on internet of freedom that you referenced earlier. And I, you know, I, I got to wonder on the one hand, I think that's going to improve potentially accountability if we put nations front and center. Hey, if something goes wrong, we know who to blame, right? You know, but I do worry about, you know, going so far in this direction of, of digital and cyber sovereignty about you know, not only, you know, the human rights implications, um, but also kind of broader societal implications around the benefits of this knowledge commons. We're a long way from the 
you know, cornucopia vision of the, of the internet back in the 90s, right? But you still have to think of some benefits of having, you know, a freer access to information. Um, right now, I agree the trend lines are very much in the opposite direction. So I, and I, I, I wonder whether even like-minded countries, historically like-minded, at least like the transatlantic alliance can come together around some consensus norms here. So I'm just wondering, like, as you, as you view this trend, as you say, even France's perspective on this, right? Um, is has evolved quite a bit over the last few years. Um, what what concerns do you have any concerns about adopting, for example, like a French model, um, you know, globally, right? Um, where, are are there any benefits that you know that uh, could could be lost um, from not realizing this this vision, which is you know very much in the rearview mirror? I I totally agree of this kind of global network commons, and as we're leading toward a much more bifurcated, even regionalized you know, vision of the internet with a European version, a North American version, and a kind of belt and road centered version. Any, any comments along those lines, please? Um, well, so the, um, as you mentioned, so here's the thing, in my kind of like the, the way I, I view the, the, the history of the development of the internet, um, it was never, um, for me, the internet has never been global. And so, um, and you know, we know that from kind of very early literature on the ethnographies of internet use across different countries or the audience studies. Um, so, you know, for example, the one study that I like to cite kind of to illustrate that point is a, is a comparative study of China's, uh, Chinese and Japan, Japanese users um, use of the internet. And so, whereas China is one of the most restrictive uh, internet uh, regimes, you know, ja you know, J Japan is not Japan. It's kind of ranks high always on the uh, freedom of the you know internet kind of rankings, um, and yet that study uh, it showed that uh, irrespective of these regimes, people uh, use uh, or get information from their you know uh, don't venture outside of their sort of national um, established. Um, information spheres or, you know, online, online information sphere or, or, or websites. Um, and essentially, so the, the argument that, that the article was pointing is that, you know, cultural factors, and again, this is where um, kind, of, kind of this, this cultural framework uh, may be useful is that um, kind of like from a, from a cultural standpoint, from a standpoint of how people have interacted with this kind of technology that we, we call, you know, global uh, has always been, um, national sort of there there is no from a user perspective there is no such thing if you will um as a global internet in terms of the um yeah like a, a, an individual's or, or a user's interaction with it um except for of course when you know there is a firewall and certain websites are you know completely inaccessible um so I've always thought of the global internet as, as a myth rather than as a reality, particularly from a cultural uh, sort of cultural perspective, ethnographic perspective, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so in some sense, so there are dangers for sure. There are there, you know, there, you know, uh, there are dangers. Uh, there are kind of worries, but in some way. Uh, not not in the sense of like endorsing or not endorsing what's happening, but in some ways, what I'm seeing it is like merely um, the infrastructure coming closer with the daily realities of how the internet has always been. Um, yeah, because you know, for example, in in Russia, the internet regime, sort of internet governance regime, has changed quite dramatically over the past 10, 15 years, but just like um, Russians have consumed local news media, you know, digital news media uh, previously, they are doing that uh, now. And mm -hmm. the sure. um, more restrictive governance uh, of the internet domestically. So for example, if Russia, if Russia wanted to block like Facebook tomorrow, if it decided to do so, um, that ability has always been there, as we know from China's example. So it's not, so kind of like the abilities to, to block it domestically, I feel like have always been there. So that, that to me is not very new. And at the same time, the user is kind of uh, very sort of 
national and local use of the internet has always, always been there. So that's not also not changing. So in some ways, I don't know, I'm kind of like, because I'm thinking of it as, as I go. So I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm traveling here a little bit. So, so I feel like infrastructure, if anything, is somewhat aligning with how, you know, the cultural kind of like from an ethnographic perspective um, or anthropological perspective, the internet has always been experienced um, across the world. Sure. No, I completely get what you're arguing. Yeah, and I, I agree completely that there was various chapters in internet governance and the U.S. was certainly dominant in those early chapters, along with a couple of other um, countries. And that and we, we have not lived up to these ideals that we were expressing even back in you know 2011 with Hillary Clinton's um, statements there. But that's kind of the question I'm interested in right now is, you know, um, to what extent do we just, you know, double down on these current trend lines? And to what extent can we can we come together? And where should we come together? I put up a piece in the chat box there mm, with an article you. we did a couple of years ago, um, just uh, kind of re going over some of this recent history, if anybody's curious. Uh, but for now, I wish we had more time because it's such a fascinating dialogue, um, Stanislav. And thank you for opening it up for us. It's, it's a wonderful project. Um, and as I said, let me know, and I'm happy to, to spread the word about your, about your class too. So just for the interest yeah. of time, how about thank one more round much. of applause? Thank you, you so all. much. Thank you so much. And sorry for keeping everybody a couple of minutes after here. Um, and I look forward to continuing to follow this with great interest. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you just as a, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, just as a reminder, guys, we have a, uh, another colloque um, this coming Monday which uh, with Brigham. So that's going to be really interesting. And we're going to continue absolutely this discussion of hot topics and internet governance, including with a new podcast series that we're launching on the great digital debate. So maybe Stanislav, we can um, invite you to participate in that, which is going to be a lot of fun. So until then, um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon, everybody. I have to jump off for another meeting, unfortunately. But so good to see you, Stanislav. And thanks again, everybody. Thank you.